Uh, Andy Grove is famous for talking about how only the paranoid survive. Right? This isn't about security, but it's about strategic inflection points. Every uh, company has moments in its history when there's massive amounts of disruption going around it. Maybe it's new technology or new competition. And the company has to decide from a strategic perspective, do they stay the course or do they pivot and change direction and potentially thrive rather than falling by the wayside? And whatever industry you look at around, many companies are having to make that decision right now. Right? They're having to decide, do they stay as with a very static and planned mode of operation? Right? Or do they pivot and change course and become more dynamic? Right? More policy driven? So they can speed up the innovation curve. And companies like Tesla are definitely putting a lot of pressure on the incumbents to make that choice right now. And it's not just dynamic and policy driven. Under the covers, it's all about you know, speeding up the feedback loop and speeding up the delivery of innovation. And how are they doing that? Right, by shortening the feedback loop, they're having access to real-time data. Take a look at Uber. They're able to dynamically adjust pricing based on demand to encourage more drivers to come on board when there's not enough riders, or uh, when there are too many riders, and they're encouraging more riders by dropping the prices. Right? And they're also enabling a culture of experimentation. They're able to try things out, get immediate feedback, and even pivot and change course if they need to. And they're speeding up innovation because they're empowering their employees to make decisions at the lowest levels and eliminating those traditional silos. Right? And they're and leveraging automation to deliver new capabilities in a matter of minutes or hours versus weeks or months. And automation is a key part of what's going on. And those who automate first are going to be the winners. Take a look in the background. You have the Tesla automobile factory. An example of continuous integration in the factory, they're leveraging software to automate the production and the rollout of these vehicles at scale right now for the Model 3. But automation is a key part of these vehicles long after they've left the factory. For the first time, I can buy a car in 6, 12, 18 months down the road, it gets better. New software updates, maybe it's a security update to address an issue with the autonomous driving experience or improving battery efficiency or the zero to 60 time. But automation is also a key part of the overall industry's vision to become a total autonomous driving experience one day. And slowly they're getting there with increasing levels of automation. And so a lot of pressure on IT to not become the bottleneck. And so you're seeing this evolution to transition from a cost center to an innovation center. And they're doing that by changing the way applications are developed, how they're architected, and the underlying infrastructure. And so what about security? Right? How does security keep pace? There's a lot of different threats, a lot of different impact in this evolution as well from a security perspective. You have the menacing threat landscape evolving with a lot of geopolitical threats, dissolving security perimeter as applications move into public cloud or a hybrid cloud. You also have an increasing level of software-defined infrastructure, whether it's network, storage, or compute. And, of course, cloud computing, private and public. And bring your own device into the network. Right? So clearly, the traditional hide-behind-the-firewall network defense is simply not enough as we move forward. And so you're seeing this evolution to DevSecOps. Right? DevSecOps is all about increasing automation, reducing the risks, lowering the costs, speeding up that delivery and reaction time when there is an issue. And they're doing that by automation, process optimization, and then continuous security. So integrating into your CI CD pipeline. And so from a DevSecOps perspective, to make that transition, it's a cultural change, right? The business has to demand we need a secure infrastructure, secure application as a key requirement and prioritize that within the company. Also, from a process, automating security so it's not a burden on the developers, and we'll talk about how in subsequent slides, and leveraging technology to automate that, whether it's uh, open source tooling, 
to help you, and we'll talk about some of the tools that can help you automate that. And containers are certainly a big part of this evolution of DevSecOps because they allowed you to build the application once and then deploy anywhere, right? Reducing the risk of introducing some sort of drift into your environment or your application as it moves from dev test into production. And the simple flow of a container is to actually build your container image from a build file, which should be version controlled, and then sharing that image across all your infrastructure, whether it's dev, test, or production, physical, virtual, private, or public cloud. And that's possible because the Open Container Initiative has standardized the runtime and the image format. Very similar to the Java world, JE spec has a similar uh, standardization, but this is for any language, any runtime. And enabling you to have that portability then across all the different providers. But what about containers at scale, right? You have a lot of issues and needs when it comes to deploying containers beyond a developer's laptop. How do you do that at scale? Instead of having one physical server, 10 VMs, you may have 100 containers. A lot of different challenges in terms of scheduling, life cycle of that container from dev to production, discovering automatically these services, monitoring, getting a feedback on your environment, scaling up and down, enabling persistence for uh, applications such as databases, also aggregating a multiple app microservices that may compose of a single application, orchestrating that at scale, high availability and resilience, and security. Right? And so that's why Kubernetes has become very popular in the de facto standard in terms of managing containers at scale, because it really uh, is a key cornerstone of this vision of having this automated software factory. An automated software factory to build your applications and then run them at scale. And it provides the ability to rapidly move applications in an automated way from dev into production. Also to provide resiliency, scalability, and increasingly we're seeing Kubernetes positioned as a security platform across any provider private, public cloud, physical, virtual. You can have a standard process and a standard tooling that spans across all these footprints. And so first, if you haven't used Kubernetes, we'll go over some of the keys. And one of the ones is delivering automation, freeing up your developers from having to manually write scripts to having a out of the box standard solution that automates the running of your containers. And the key aspect of it is orchestrating. Orchestrating a collection of microservices and being able to deploy those at scale across your infrastructure no matter where it is. And it's declaratives. So in this example, I have two web servers and a single database. And I want to deploy that across my cluster. Kubernetes will automatically provision those containers across my nodes, provisioning the network, the storage, and the compute and making sure that I always have two web servers and a single database in the back end, and also discovering these services and putting a service as a front end so it abstracts the underlying containers as they communicate from service to service. It also will maintain automatically the health of that infrastructure as I go. So I declare two web servers in a single database, it will ensure that that state is good. And if it detects a failure, it'll automatically replace a down container. Likewise, it'll also detect when there's increasing load and if there's a need to deploy additional capacity to meet the needs of your customers. Now I wanna go through some of the key points around security from images down to CI, CD. So first off, container images. What are some best practices from a security perspective. So as I mentioned, containers allow you to build once, deploy anywhere. And a container allows you to package in your app in immediate dependencies. So you have a very lightweight footprint. So you've decreased your attack surface from a security perspective as well, because it just has what is necessary for that application, providing the portability across these platforms. And if you take a deeper look at the container image, right, traditionally today, a developer, if they're developing in Java, is delivering a jar file for their application. 
But in the container world, now they're delivering an application image, the container image, that consists of the application, the dependencies from a language runtime perspective, as well as the OS dependencies. So you think from a security perspective, wow, is the developer taking on increased level of responsibility when it comes to security? Right? Because of these additional layers, we don't want that. Right? And so how do you address that? Who owns these different layers? Think of the container image kind of as a tarball with multiple layers, and each layer has a difference, the delta upon it. And you can version control these as well. So one of the key things around containers is to treat them as immutable. Right? What does this mean? This means taking all that unique configuration and data outside of the container. So on the left side, we have the container image, which just has the application, the static parts. The configurations should be removed. Right? These are environment variables, configuration files. And you can leverage objects and resources within Kubernetes. One is called the config map. And then the secret is uh, similar but encrypted. So for config map, I may want to store the XML file to configure JBoss inside it. I may want to store the password to access my database in the secret. Right? And that can be uh, propagated at runtime into the container instance and stored as an environment variable or a config file that's mounted on a volume inside the container. And then, of course, the data. I want to access data. Traditionally, your data exists outside the cluster initially, and so you want to be able to remote access that service, which you can do, or you can bring that data into the cluster and leveraging a persistent volume within Kubernetes that it can provision. So take a deeper look at the config map. In this example of an XML file configuring the application on the left side, I then would import that into a config map in Kubernetes. It would store it in the etcd key value store in the cluster. And then when I launch my application, or my microservice into the cluster, it would create a container instance from that image and then inject that configuration either as an environment variable or a flat file that's mounted on the pod. Yep. And of course, another best practice is to be sure that you're signing your images. So you know that it's a trusted image, you know where it came from, and you can validate that before you launch that instance and if it's not a known trusted source, prevent it from launching in your cluster. Container builds. So we talked about roles and responsibilities right, of those different layers. You can carry over the same uh, separation of concerns that you have today. So you have the sysadmin focusing on the base OS image. Uh, you have the middleware team focusing on the middleware layer. And then the developer focusing on the JAR application. And they can focus just on the security issues within that layer. And you can build upon the layers to deliver a full-blown container image. Right? So as an organization, my middleware for JBoss can be built on the standard RHEL 7 base image. And I can deploy that and provide that to my developers. And they can add their uh, source code or their compiled uh, application on top of that. You could also. Uh, do a custom supply chain. So once the application is out in production, you could monitor the registry to see if there are any updates to any of your dependencies from a layer perspective. And if one of those has been updated with version N plus one, for example, I can then trigger an automated rebuild of my container instance. This way, developers don't have to be monitoring if there's security updates or issues at the OS or the application layer. Uh, so some best practices around build files, you know, treat them as a blueprint. It's a recipe for how to rebuild that image. Version control that build file, store in Git. Uh, don't log in an SSH into your image and make changes and save it. Right? You don't have a way of recreating that very easily. Uh, be explicit with the versions. Latest today is not latest tomorrow. Uh, always list the full registry name, uh, fully qualified as you see on the left. And make sure you specify a user because when you're pulling images, the default if a user isn't specified as root. And it's not a good practice to be running processes as root. And we'll talk about why. And then be careful each time you put run in the build file, it does create a new layer. So not very efficient. Uh, container registry security. So we did a scan of the public registry, found 64% of the image have a higher medium security issue. So be mindful of what you're pulling into your enterprise. 
Uh, the first step most customers I work with, what they do is they set up a private registry within their enterprise behind their firewall. They have an audit trail of who's pushing what. They have a complete uh, archive of all the versions. So in 18 months when I need to go back to an older version, I have it. I don't have to worry about a public re registry having deleted that particular image. Uh, container host security, right? At Red Hat, we talk about how containers are Linux, right? Out of the box, Docker, Kubernetes are not secure for an enterprise. You need to take several measures to make sure that they're secure. One of those is ensuring that your hosts are secure. And in, within Linux, there's several capabilities that provide that extra level of security. Uh, one is C groups. It provides quality of service. So you don't have that noisy neighbor problem of multiple containers or processes on the same host. It allows you to guarantee uh, resources from a memory, CPU, network, file system. And namespaces provides that logical network separation as well as it provides that separation of users and groups. So a root user in a container is not a root user at the host. Why is that bad? Potentially, if it, if it wasn't the case, is because if you hack into the container, the root user would then be the root at the host. And we don't want that as well as root at every other container. Uh, SecComp, uh, you wanna apply SecComp filters if you can to reduce the access of a container to the kernel. Right? There's hundreds of system calls. Every container doesn't need access to all those system calls. So go ahead and filter those out and limit it to only the ones it needs. And of course, when you can, always mount things with read-only, so you prevent things from being written and modified uh, from a potential hacking perspective. Right? And so just some overall best practices, don't run as root, limit the capabilities, limit SSH access, right? use namespaces, both network and user, uh, define resource quotas so you limit uh, what they can consume, you'll have a denial of service problem and define resource quotas, enable logging, enable and apply security router, right? Not just to the container, but to the host as well in your infrastructure. And then make sure if you can run production unprivileged containers as read only. Uh, there's a new uh, container runtime called CRIO, which allows you to run in a read only format. So you may wanna uh, check that out as well. Continuous integration with containers. So one of the things, uh, here is highlighting the difference. You have uh, a C application, J Java, Node.js, Perl, PHP. And this is highlighting the components that get pulled in when you build an image. Right? So for example, in the second column, you're pulling in the JRE, Bash, and glibc. And the triangle indicates how many security notifications have been issued for that particular component. So the JRE in this example has 66. That's a lot. And that's since RHEL 7, and that was, this slide's pretty old. So there's been a lot more. So what this tells me is I need to have a process to continually scanning my image e even after I pull them down or create them. Right. And so I want to insert this into my CI CD pipeline. Right? And in a CI CD pipeline in a container world, it typically looks like this. You have your source, pulling it from Git, continuously integrating, build your application. I then create the RPM version of that app. From a distribution perspective, I create the image from those RPMs, I store it in the registry, and then I deploy from the registry at scale into my cluster. The overall flow uh, looks something like this. Is one is Kubernetes provides that network namespace. So it provides logical separation of my environments across the same physical infrastructure. So I can have dev, test, and production all in the same cluster, all on the same infrastructure if I so choose or I could have multiple clusters uh, separating dev tests from production. Uh, but one of the things that allows me to do as well is you can see the flow of how you would actually take a build file in your source code and then build the container image. Right? I would build, pull it from the uh, uh, build image that I have to produce my application, store it in my image registry, and then distribute that from dev, test, and production. Right? Build once, deploy anywhere. Uh, but from a security perspective, in this flow, I may want to introduce a phase to s uh, perform a security scan. Right? So every time I build an image, scan my image and make sure there are no security vulnerabilities. Both from a policy perspective 
and from a vulnerability perspective. So I can define a security policy, make sure it complies with it, and I can scan for any known vulnerabilities. Uh, I can use tools like Upstream op OpenSCAP uh, or third-party tools out there to help with this process, or some registries allow me to automatically trigger a scan anytime I uh, push an image to my registry. Uh, one of the key things also with images is you want to make them reproducible if possible. Why is that? Well, security hacks are all about changing source code. Right? Some of them are attacking the build environment and injecting security issues by replacing perhaps the compiler or other components in their build environment that may go undetected. And so here's an example of how you could do this in a container environment. You have your source code, and then you leverage what's called a build image. The build image has your build runtime environment, and then you would actually take your source code and compile it, and then produce a resulting container image. Right? Remove all the build artifacts, it's lightweight, and just contains what you need. And that build image is actually version controlled. So I could tag my container image with whatever build image was used to produce it. I can go back in time and I know exactly the build environment that was used to build that container image. Right? So reproducible builds. This is a step to help you get there. Uh, one of the key things also is to have that continuous feedback loop. And so from a monitoring perspective, you want to be able to have a set of tools at your disposal that give you that feedback uh, in terms of your, your images. And so when you move from a kind of a monolithic world where you're monitoring the host and your application to a container world, there's some differences. So one is that you need to be monitoring some metrics around the container level. And there's some tools within Kubernetes such as C Advisor to help you get that. And then also at the Kubernetes level, right? You want to have feedback in terms of your cluster, uh, the services in that cluster, how they're uh, responding or not uh, from a health perspective. And then as you move from a monolithic to a microservice, you need to be prepared uh, to have tooling to help you with a more distributed architecture. So some distributed tracing tools, maybe Jaeger or others can be used to help you trace your, uh, the flow end to end from microservice to microservice and see where the bottlenecks are and see where the non-responsiveness is. Uh, next, we're going to talk about uh, deployment strategies all the way through uh, what's next. So first off, deployment strategies. Uh, one of the things you want to be aware of uh, in a container world, as you move your container from dev into production, uh, I'm no longer going to go and patch production. Right? Why is that? Well, in the current world, it takes months or weeks to deploy a new version. And so I go to production, I patch, I need to address that security issue right away. Well, when I move to a CI CD pipeline that's automated, I can now address issues in a matter of minutes or hours. So a better practice is actually to go back to development, create version N plus one, and always push it through the complete pipeline. Right? And so I'm going to build it once into development, move to QA, staging, and then production. Right. So what are some ways to automate deploying at scale? Because now in a container world, instead of having one physical 10 VMs, I probably have 100 containers equivalent. And I need some automation to quickly deploy this new update to my production environment. And so out of the box, you can leverage Kubernetes to do a variety of deployment strategies depending on what your needs are, and we'll talk about those all the way from recreate down to database migrations. So first off, recreate. So this is uh, when you have uh, a need to deploy a new version, but you want to keep it really simple. It's okay to have downtime for this particular service. And so I'm going to use the recreate method. That's where you have version one out in production. I'm developing version 1.2 to address a security issue, I'm going to bring down the cluster entirely. So I'm down for this period of time, and then boom, I deploy that new version. Right? Very simple. I didn't have to interface with my development team to ensure backward compatibility. 
I didn't have to uh, worry about that at all. And so from an operations perspective, it allowed me to quickly do this. But there is downtime, so maybe it's you know, like your lunch menu service or something like that. It's something that's not critical. Uh, it also could be used, especially like for databases. Right? You have to bring down the database uh, from a production traffic, make a schema change. You may want to use the recreate for this. Rolling updates. Uh, another way of deploying new updates when there's a security issue is to do a rolling update. Right? This is where you have version one out in production and on a set the max unavailable to zero and max surge to one so I append a new uh, pod at the end here rather than replace so I keep the same capacity. And so exactly that, I deployed my new version 1.2 but I didn't add it into cluster yet until it passed the health check. So Kubernetes will do a health check, uh, see if it's maybe connecting to the backend database. Once it does that and passes that successfully, I can bring it into the, uh, the cluster. And then gradually roll it out to 50% until I completely roll that new version out. So one of the things here is that I didn't have any downtime. Right? I didn't have to bring down service. It was serving traffic throughout this process. It was gradually shifting to the new version. So from a development perspective, I need to make sure my application can handle two versions side by side at the same time. Right? I need to have compatibility from a data and API perspective. I need to be working with my development team collaborating uh, to do this. Right? There was a, di a little bit of additional resource overhead as I added that seventh uh, pod initially. Right. So microservices, right? that's a key part of moving to this container platform. But one of the key things that uh, Ronnie said at Microsoft was that only a third of the ideas actually prove out. And how can Kubernetes help you experiment and try things out? And one is through A-B testing with Canary uh, deployments. Uh, so this is where you have A-B version A on the left, and then version B, I, addressing a new security issue. I want to make sure before I go all in, it doesn't negatively impact my business. At the same time, I had changed my recommendation engine. So you can see it's recommending different products at the bottom there. Right, so I have version A out in production receiving all my traffic. My click-through rate on my mobile app is 25% uh, for those recommendations. I developed the new version B. I want to get some feedback. How is that in the re respond? Is the security issue going to have a negative impact on the click-through rate? And so I want to monitor that, and I saw that the conversion rate actually increased. So that's good. I want to go all in then on that new version. <coughs> right, by switching the ingress router, uh, within Kubernetes, uh, I could leverage like HA proxy or a third party to route that traffic. But what if there was a, a negative impact? That security issue actually decreased the click-through rate of my uh, mobile app. And so in that case, I could actually do a rollback right, quickly. I didn't have any downtime. I just uh, changed the ingress router to route the traffic uh, back to version 8. So Canary deployments allows me to experiment with live traffic, get some feedback, and I can uh, maintain, or I can control how much of that traffic goes to that new version. I can limit it based on geography, et cetera. What about database, right? How would I handle uh, addressing version controlling my schema changes in my database, right? So that's what database migrations are about. In this example, uh, I have version one in production. I have version two in test and version three in development. And I want to push those changes uh, through the pipeline. And one way to do that is you can have uh, some SQL uh, scripts to actually modify the schema and actually version control the schema as well. So there's upstream uh, open source tools like Flyway that allow you to do this. And that's what I use in this example is so you basically write your migration script and then you build a container image with Flyway in the migration script and you version control that, store it in a uh, image repository, and then 
deploy that image into your Kubernetes cluster, which would actually uh, make that change. And so here in this image I've created, I have the flyway application runtime, and then I have the migration script uh, built into that image. It's version controlled, so I know what version's out in my cluster and being applied. And so how would I do that is here's a cluster for Postgres. I have it deployed. I have version one of the schema uh, out there. And I want to update it. Maybe there's a security issue. I need some modification to my schema. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to schedule what's called a job. So think of it as a cron job in my cluster. And it'll instantiate one instance of the flyaway image into my cluster. It found an available node. Uh, and then it has the connection information, in this case, JDBC connection uh, to my database. And it's going to run automatically that migration script and apply the change to my database. Uh, so it'll bring it up to version 2 of the schema. And so it's recording what version of the schema it is. And I have a complete record of what changes were made because I have these, this history in my registry of all the different images with the changes it made uh, built into the image. Right. And so here, I have it successfully deployed. Right. So uh, database migrations. Also, let's talk about uh, network and a few other items before we close out. So one thing uh, from a security perspective Kubernetes provides is around network isolation. Right? So it does this through network namespaces. And network namespaces allow logical separation of networks, kind of sandboxing environments uh, through software. And the network namespace can be used in a few different ways. One is it can allow you to have logically separated environments, dev tests, and production, as I mentioned, on the same infrastructure from a networking perspective. Also, it enables multi-tenancy. So I can have 13 applications, 13 networks on the same host all logically separated and isolated from each other. Right. I can also define network policy. So this is a more granular level of control. I can actually control the traffic flow from the server to service at a very granular level by defining and enabling network policy in my cluster. So one of the things you may want to uh, check out at a deeper level. Uh, thirdly, you know, network security. How do I integrate with my existing physical network model? My typical network model, I'll have a three-tier zone, DMZ, the internal, and the database zone, right? And the traffic is usually highly regulated uh, from top down to a Kubernetes world. Kubernetes networking is very flat, right? Everybody has an IP. They can all communicate with each other. But now I want to be able to apply that in a traditional network model. So how do I do that? Well, here are the three approaches we've seen most customers take. Is that one, is they set up a separate Kubernetes cluster per zone. Right? And then you have your ingress and egress routing the traffic through that particular zone for that cluster. Right? And in the middle, what I can do is have a single cluster that spans across all your zones. And then I tag certain applications through labels to route their traffic to the particular zone. So A and B would go through zone A, and applications C and D would go through zone B through their ingress and egress. And then thirdly, if I want to get more fine-grained control, I could actually identify and label certain hosts and bind them to certain zones. This means only applications for that zone would be run on that host. This is less efficient in terms of uh, utilization of your infrastructure, potentially, uh, but may provide some peace of mind because you don't have different applications from different zones sitting on the same physical host or container in or a, a cloud instance. Skip that. Uh, in terms of storage security, right? so one of the things in uh, uh, Kubernetes, it does allow you to provision uh, storage. So if I want to have persistence, I can create a persistence volume. And then my application developer can be assigned some quota, and they can make a claim to that storage. I can also create different tiers of storage. 
and I could bind that tier of storage to particular environments to create some level of security uh, for that storage and restriction. Uh, API and platform access. So one of the key things out of the box, and if you look at the news, some of the key security vulnerabilities and hacks to Kubernetes have been folks exploiting access to the API or the portal. So you want to make sure that you lock down and you have that bound to some sort of authentication and authorization system. Right? So you take a look at Weight Watchers, uh, Tesla, they've had some front page breaches of their Kubernetes environments out in the cloud right, because it's not fully locked down. So be aware, you know, when you install a container environment, Kubernetes environment, it requires hardening out of the box traditionally, especially from upstream. And then lastly, where we're going is around federation. So multiple clusters under single API control. This could be important from a security perspective because I can define application to have specific security requirements. So maybe I have one cluster that meets my PCI standard and I could route that application to my PCI compliant uh, cluster. All right, so what's next? Right, as you uh, look forward, and there's a, a talk uh, a little bit touching on service mesh later today. You know, Istio is a uh, service mesh uh, which becomes increasingly important as you uh, move to microservices, the network is becoming more of a, a critical component. Uh, you wanna have some key capabilities in the back pocket and freeing up the developers from having to code this themselves within their application, but rather using what we call side proxy to help you manage traffic control. So I talked about uh, managing traffic today with Kubernetes, but Istio provides a finer grain of control of your traffic. So instead of like one out of six pods of redirecting my traffic, I can actually get to a, a very detailed level of percentage. I could say 1% of my traffic test out that new version B. Uh, also, service resiliency, right? I don't want to uh, deploy my application in a bunch of microservices and have a single microservice bring down my entire application because it's not responding. Right? I want to be able to say, hey, if that service is not responding, time out, stop sending traffic, try again in five minutes. Chaos testing, you know, I want to inject some fault. You saw the keynote. Istio is a way of helping automate that. And having observability, getting the metrics of your microservices so I can feed that into some distributed tracing tool like uh, Uber's Jaeger, for example, and then also increasing my security, right? Service to service communication, I gotta handle keys, rotate those keys, that can help you, as well as restricting outbound uh, traffic as well by default through the proxy. I can limit that, uh, and that's kind of the default. So I have to explicitly define who has the ability to move outside of my cluster from a traffic perspective. So those are just some of the things. There's a talk later by uh, Christian, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about service mesh. And then lastly, operators. So CoreOS came up with this concept of operators. How do I have a uh, cloud native or Kubernetes native experience and capability for my third party and my enterprise apps that's on par with a public cloud service? So when I use a public cloud service, I get auto install, auto upgrades, it detects if there's drift and corrects it, I don't have to worry about backups, et cetera. How do I automate that? How do I take the run book that I have for my enterprise apps that does those things manually to bringing that into Kubernetes in an automated way? And so operators allows you to do that, exactly that, is to automate all those traditional operations for your microservice so I don't have to worry about it and it takes care of it. Take a look at that. That's certainly uh, something that you're going to see a lot of development both by third parties and for your enterprise apps. So as you make this transition, one last slide, uh, here are some metrics you may want to track as you make this evolution uh, to DevSecOps. And with that, I'm out of time. Uh, here's my contact information. Feel free to reach out. I'll be outside afterwards to answer any questions as well. Uh, Chris Vantine. I'm on uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, and my email as well. Thank you so much.